Thank you, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday webinar from Tiff University Network. Uh, the title of our, of our talk today is The Challenges and Opportunities for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Public Interest Technology Entrepreneurs. This might seem like a long list, but it's a huge deal, and we want to talk everything about it. Uh, but we're also really, really excited to, to launch the report also from, from within this topic around BPOC pit entrepreneurs, we're gonna share the link at the at our, our presentation. But so please make sure to check it out once once the, the webinar is done. We're happy to be collaborating with the University of Michigan's uh, Public Interest Technology Knowledge Network and Black Tech Futures Research Institute. Without further ado, let me introduce uh, the lead of this conversation, Tayo Fabusui. He is uh, he's from research faculty at the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. And Tayo, the floor is all yours. So um, we will do things a little bit differently today. Um, but before I kind of um, show you the lay of the lands, um, let me um, uh, quickly introduce uh, my panel members. So we have a, a well-rounded um, panel composition here today. Um, so with us today is uh, Dr. Fallon Wilson, who is the co-founder of Black Tech Futures Research Institute. Um, we also have Rayma Hampshire, who is actually working with us on the UN side as a strategic advisor um, for uh, our Peak Knowledge Network um, initiatives. We also have Emeka Egwekwe, who is the executive director of Code Crew, uh, that is based in Memphis, um, Tennessee. And uh, um, we also have um, Selena Siha, who is a recent graduate of her experiential learning program and is now a legis legislative staff member um, at the Office of, of um, Representative Kana in Detroit. So we will have two presentations um, for you guys. Um, one, of the, one of those I will be presenting in the first 10, min 10 minutes. And Melissa Brown, who is the co-founder of Black Tech Futures Research Institute will be uh, the one coming immediately after me, Melissa. So thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us today. And then without much ado, I think um, we will start. Um, one of the few things we're trying to do as much as possible is to get um, the audience member excited um, about this presentation. And so along the lane, we really appreciate if you could chime in point your questions in the chat box and we will see it on this end um but quickly um we're gonna have two set of presentations for you and then we'll spend roughly 45 minutes with the panel itself and then we, we will try and have 20 to 25 minutes that we will use to engage um with the audience but just to just to kick off um this this session um i want you um to think in terms of the pig space when you look at the public interest technology space and you think about the constraint, what word comes to mind? Um, we just need from you just one word. Uh, this is kind of like a virtual poll. And so from your own hand, um, you don't need to sign in into the Mentimeter. Um, just go in there um, and then kind of uh, um, um, input the word that comes to your mind. Just, just write off the bat without giving it much thought Maybe this could be something that in some way you run into now and then just kind of give us one word uh, in terms of um, um, what you see uh, when it comes to constraint within the pitch space. Okay. All right. Um, so once we, once we have that, um, I think I would like to go on. Uh, with the presentation. I will be the one um, leading the presentation roughly for 10 minutes, and then I will give the floor to Melissa. What we're trying to do with these with this session is to actively engage with you uh, more in terms of the discussion, and then actually more in terms, and then learn from you in how do we build career pathways for diverse public interest tech entrepreneurs. Um, so one of the few things we've been trying to do on our own hand as much as possible is to listen to folks who are in the trenches or in the field when it comes to the pitch space. And this is one way by which we are engaging with the audience 
and it's an abstraction of her year one report uh, with grants from New America. Next slide. So a year one grant has one primary objective. I mean, having some understanding of the lead experiences of paid entrepreneurs. And then once we have a really good sense of what that looks like, using those insights to strengthen their career pathways. Um, so just to give you kind of a 50,000 foot view of the approach that we use, we kind of blended, we married a top-down approach that is heavy on the secondary data set using US, uh, US census public use microdata sample files. Um, essentially, we did the analysis for the whole of the continental US. We have a, a good sense in terms of what does the magnitude of these population, what does it look like? In what parts of the country are they concentrated? What is the social demographic makeup of this population? Okay. And then we now marry that with, with more of a bottom-up approach that is made up of two, um, two, um, two, two like layers. One is a qualitative interview with BIPOC uh, paid entrepreneurs. You know, so like essentially we scatter those interviews and we have detailed conversations with these folks. And then that was complemented with an experiential learning class that peer students with um, by POC paid entrepreneurs in the Detroit area. So one of the few things we're trying to do is, can we get to a thread that essentially spans all these? What I mean by that is that there's a micro thread to it, which essentially that pairing, the experiential learning class is the micro portion of it. And then there's a meso, which we, which will now expanding on, on like in her year two grant to kind of ramp up the numbers of folks that are active in the space that we're having deep, meaningful conversations with. And then there's the macro part of it, which is a top-down approach that is more like secondary data set driven. And the whole purpose is that at the end of the day, we could characterize, we could paint this landscape. We could have a sense in terms of areas where improvements could be made and hopefully be able to roll out interventions that speak to this. Next slide, please. So I know there's no consensus even in terms of what public interest technology means. And so here, just to kind of like um, animate these conversations, we've, we've just put two here. And both those two have from New America. Um, um, you could see the text that were in bold, um, and you could see even, in, even like in terms of the pitch that has been made. But I would challenge you to take a look at two things there. One, you one in terms of what what do you have dealt or what do you have applied? So that's that that is it. You can see that the like the first part of the definition is about applying something or adopting. And typically it tends to be like a skill set or like an expertise. And then what do you deploy that to? Once you have a sense of the skill set or the or the expertise, what do you deploy that to? For the latter, it's to kind of promote the public good. You know, it's kind of kind of essentially to advance the public interest. And there is no debate about that. But for the former in terms of the skill sets, it's, it's, it still seems to see um, there is still some gray areas in terms of what skill sets qualify here. And that's one of the few things we've kind of like been ruminating, chewing on on this and saying, okay, what does it mean if I have a sociology background and I'm active in this space, even though I may not have te technological expertise, where does that place me within the broader ecosystem? Next slide, please. So one of the ways we, we've been trying to think about this is to, is, to, is, to, is to have a fairly formalized approach to defining this space. Um, if you take a look at the first and the last, um, cycle or like oval shapes, the social entrepreneur and technologist, in some way, when you marry them, the interface, the intersect um, is what would define as hate entrepreneur. You know, essentially you're doing some social good, but maybe enriched with like technological solutions. But if you take a look at the last bullet point on the right hand side, it says articulate the vision and inspire enthusiasm for tech solutions. And so this means that you do not, actually you may have a soft background, but that you see benefits in tech solutions and you're willing to share these, you're willing to kind of advance that agenda. 
And once we now couple that with the first, with the first um, hoval ship in terms of exploring opportunities to create positive impact on common good, that is what we see in terms of the PIP entrepreneur. And now we have interest in Blacks, Indigenous, and peoples of color in terms of their lived experiences, you know, and being able to find ways by which we could collectively surface that, elevate that, and move that into the mainstream. Um, so that is what explains in terms of why the interest is on by POC entrepreneurs. And the next slide uh, provides more insights into that. So we take a look at the as a Venn diagram, and the innermost core of it essentially represents the core, the segment of BIPOC with entrepreneurs. Um, they bring diversity of experiences, lived experiences, I mean, into this debate, you know, and they strengthen and enrich the collective knowledge and problem definitions within PIT. We think it's really crucial that voices that have historically been marginalized and surprised be amplified, you know. Um, I don't believe that, I don't think there's any debate that if you have interest in the collective good, then it has to be the case that these voices that have historically been pushed to the peripheries are brought to the core. And that is one of the few things we're trying to do here. Next slide, please. So these are, these are some of the findings, given, given, given the fact that we don't have the luxury of, of, um, of time. I mean, I want to kind of just speak to these issues, uh, maybe like kind of a 50,000 foot view. There are three key salient findings that we come in um, have worked from our year one um, activities. Um, the funding issue, and then the gender and racial inequities, and then networks and net networking and coordination, coordination challenges. And I will speak to each, um, starting with the next slide, that speak to access to seed funding. Next slide, please. So this is the way we take a look at this when we look in terms of access to seed capital. You know, um, oftentimes, uh, depending on how big your network is, you know, you could tap in, into like friends, you could tap into family, you could tap into like maybe like angel investors to essentially give birth to your idea. And one of the primary constraints for for BIPOC um, um, entrepreneurs is being able to access this seed capital. We know that these are high risk ventures. That is just the way it is, you know. And that typically a lot of them will fail, you know. Even when you take a look at in terms of similar initiatives in the private sector, it tends to be like high risk, high yield. But actually, there's an extra challenge here where not everything is dollar denominated. There's a public good that these individuals are trying to create. And it's really like a burdensome and onerous task to get access to seed capital. Um, and so a lot of the consensus, a lot of the findings that coming from the folks that we talk to in the pitch space um, really um, speak to this issue. Next slide, please. So the second one, is looking in terms of um, networking and coordination challenges. And so what I mean by that is, it tends to be the case um, where we've been, we, we have tried to, to use these drops of water to represent these individuals, you know? And you tend to do well in this space if resources and information flow are not constrained, you know? You tend to do well in this space if linkages could be built across these droplets of water, you know, um, you tend to do well in this space. Um, if in some form folks could relate to your own experiences, that could be subjective, it could be idiosyncratic, you know, um, it could be peculiar to you, but if you just say, this is my life too, in some form I can relate um, to this. And then finally, you tend to do well when your own process, your own journey, you see it reflected in terms of what has been done, in terms of what has been mainstream. And so that's what, what we mean by in terms of the standards and the challenge between what is the core and the periphery. So examples are done here in, uh, where um, even folks who are supposedly well-meaning, they just use their own lived experiences 
to essentially impose a standard on his space. Okay, and everything else is measured relative to that standard. So classic example is the US dollar. Folks will say that was a reserve currency of the world. And the US government could print dollars to essentially uh, finance its own debt. Very few countries can do that. That is, that is kind of the analogy that you have in this space, where by and large some people, again, maybe well-meaning, essentially define the standards based in terms of their own um, experiences. And by so doing, the kind of the experiences of others that may not have the same, uh, uh, that may not have um, the same outlook to life. Next slide, please. So um, one of the few things that we observe from the secondary data set that we worked on is that these massive goal you know, in terms of um, even like returns to like, um, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of the income, you know, so like the average white male in 2018 made close to two times the average black male within the paid uh, entrepreneurship state. And what we did, we did, a, I mean, this may not be, um, given the data that we have to work with, we have to make some assumptions. Um, what we're looking at is in terms of whether you responded saying you have a STEM or STEM related background, whether you work in the area of social entrepreneurship and whether your next code where you work in some form, I mean, reflects that. You know? So that may be more of like a ceiling, but it beats flying blind. It still reveals some information uh, to us. And then again, going back to some things in terms of seed funding, you could see that for every hundred dollars, you know, that all male, irrespective of race, um, races, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the average female race is just like roughly four over five of that. And to the degree to which there are returns that are, that, that, that are essentially conditioned by the size of your enterprise, all those things speak to all of them. So I think, again, that's why a lot of what we're seeing is you have to be of one form, of one structure before, uh, before you are seen uh, to be believable within this space. Um, next slide, and then immediately after that, please. So we have a year to grant that we're currently working on now. And I want to speak to those recommendations within, within the context of that year to grant. Like a lot of what we're looking at is when you take a look again, the landscape, the lay of the land, the forest, what does it look like? And in what ways can that landscape or forest can, in what way can it be made healthier? And what we mean by that is this. You could see, if we use the forest as an analogy, it's green, it's lush, it's thriving, it's growing. But more so in this space, we are interested in a landscape that is democratic. And when we say democratic, this is not about votes per se. It's more in the functional sense, where by and large, we could strike some balance among the competing needs of different interests or group of people within the society. I think that is really, really crucial. And to the degree to which some folks' voices have been discounted or even entirely erased, then we do not have a democratic uh, landscape or an ecosystem. And so one of the things we're trying to do is, is we need to address the numbers problem. Folk of color, blacks, indigenous, they have to be more visible within their space. They have to be much more visible and to the extent to which, even though you may not be at the frontiers, that you are an informed consumer of this, and you could hold people's feet to the fire in terms of the folks who are in the corridors of power who are making some of this policy, we think is very, very crucial. Um, and the notion of visibility now in some way kind of bleeds into a representation. So what do we mean by that? People will say about bias in our garden. I mean, we could have debate about that for, I mean, from now to God knows when. Then we talk about data that may not be representative of the population. All those are valid, but really do they talk in terms of framing of the problem? And we know that the framing of the problem conditions what solutions you are even thinking of. You know, if you're not in the room, if you do not have a seat at the table, then a lot of those, convers a lot of those potential feasible solutions may even exclude what will even cure the pain points that you have. The third one, which we reckon is so crucial in terms of learning is 
these folks lived experiences that may be subjective, that there are ways that we, we, we could put structure around them, that they are now made explicit and transferable. You know, we think that is really crucial, that I can relate better to you if I can see my life reflected in terms of what you do. You know, I, we think that that is really, uh, that, uh, that that is something that we have to, to, to put a lot of investment in. And then finally, we want to explore and exploit the strength of weak ties. What do I mean by this? Um, a, the folks of ours now that you guys can see, let's say we belong to the same household, the household that we know the same set of people, you know, we have the same set of friends and we tend to put a lot of emphasis on that. But it turns out a job becoming available somewhere, a seed ground that I could tap into, you know, may be known by someone that is one or two degrees removed from me. And that there is strength in terms of these types that may not be that strong. And that if we could, if we, if we could stand up a platform where some of these conversations could take place, where some of these virtual interactions could be had, you know, where some of the relationship could be seeded, then we could start getting to these information constraints that in some way we kind of crack the door open when it comes to access to resources that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Next slide, please. And um, finally, um, just to quickly wrap up, that's the link to, um, to um, our year one report, which um, Alvaro just put in the chat box. We would really encourage you to take a look at it. Um, there's a saying that money makes the world go round. We acknowledge support from New America. They were the ones that funded these, uh, her year one um, grant. Um, shout out to the students and PTEC entrepreneurs that um, took part in our in our experiential learning class and the interviews that we conducted. And then a huge thank you to my collaborators, um, Jessica and Rema. Um, and then finally, um, Robert Hampshire, who was the PI on the initial grant that we had uh, from New America. Um, so Robert is president on leave at USDOT as the chief science officer. He has made and continues to make um, uh, um, a lot of input in this space, and we benefited immensely from his contribution. Thanks, Robert. And thank you. So, Melissa, I think um, the floor is yours now. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Melissa Brown. Um, as Tayo has said, I am one of the co-founders uh, of Black Tech Futures Research Institute. Um, my my co-founder, uh, Dr. Fallon Wilson, is uh, one of the panelists. Uh, we want to thank um, the University of Michigan and New America for this opportunity to participate in this panel discussion. Um, for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about the work that Black Tech Futures uh, Research Institute is doing. Um, we kind of consider it uh, on the ground working with the uh, um, Black Tech ecosystem builders, um, what that looks like, how do they view themselves. Uh, we conducted a survey, uh, a, a purposeful survey, actually, a very small sample, um, but we're going to see where there is an alignment with the folks that we work with and how they fit into this broader discussion um, uh, and how they view themselves as uh, pit entrepreneurs or not. So uh, next slide, real briefly. Okay, so Black Tech Futures Research Institute, um, our mission is to build a national network of city-based researchers and Black tech ecosystem builders, who um, I'll define what that, that term means in a moment, um, who conduct research to build sustainable and vibrant Black tech ecosystems. And we define Black tech ecosystems as an ecology of institutions within cities and within Black communities that are optimized and aligned through a lens of liberation, inclusion, and equity. Um, we believe that by utilizing um, three methods, we can help build thriving Black tech ecosystems, that those um, approaches or, or um, methods include an ecosystem approach um, by eradicating the um, intersecting racial tech disparities within cities um, through the alignment of community leaders and collective impact from community-led research um, by increasing, our goal is to kind of increase the number of Black researchers that are focused on innovation, technology, um, and public policy. Um, by, and we do this by growing uh, talent within our cities. And then 
of course, making change black through uh, policy, black tech policy, using the research that we collect, the data that we collect to inform liberating policy recommendations and advocate at the municipal, state, and national level. Uh, next slide. So the purpose of this survey, um, as I mentioned before, is to ascertain how uh, Black tech e ecosystem builders or BTE builders, as we refer to them shortly uh, or briefly, is um, individuals who may support the tech pipeline, support STEM and computer science, particularly K-12, um, support Black tech companies, or they may work with city leaders to create innovation communities in Black neighborhoods in their cities. Um, the survey was to view uh, that, how they view their work, the impact they have, um, and how they view themselves. So we did uh, a survey of 18 respondents from across five cities, Birmingham, Chicago, Houston, Memphis, and Nashville. Um, and the screen here gives also some uh, demographic, brief demographic information of our uh, survey respondents. Uh, next slide. So our fellow, um, we refer to our BTE builders as fellows in our program. And I wanna take a moment to say that the work that we're doing is funded by the, um, uh, the uh, Ewing Marion, uh, the Ewing Marion uh, uh, Kaufman Foundation grant. Uh, so we wanna also give them a thanks and a shout out as well. So our findings are showing that 78% um, of our fellows that were surveyed um, identified themselves as BTE builders. Um, less than 6% identified themselves as public interest technologists. Next slide. Um, our results also show that 44% um, work full time as tech entrepreneurs. Um, with uh, roughly 17% uh, or just under 17% either doing this work part-time or working a separate full-time job and also doing tech work on the side, right? Next slide. So we asked them, what type of community tech work do you do in the Black community? 65% of them said that they focus on diversity inclusion for the Black community within those cities. Um, to this definition of public interest technology, our group of fellows um, do not see their intervention work based on the popularized um, public interest technology work of working on algorithms and programming uh, uh, and things of that nature. 47% um, support tech startups. 41% um, are researchers or community advocates um, within their communities. Only 18%, as I mentioned, um, only work on dismantling bias algorithms. Um, next slide. So we asked them, why did you start working in tech? 77% uh, said it was basically to encourage themselves and others to build the future that they want and to create a, a future where tech job options, that there are tech job options for Black people. Um, and then we have uh, different, we have other responses that include um, to bridge the digital divide, to provide a foundation for tech entrepreneurs like themselves to find support, and finally to build a bright future for Black people in an emerging automated economy. Next slide. So, what were the pressures that they found um, in terms of being a Black tech ecosystem builder? Um, 53% basically said they felt tokenized by local stakeholders who only want to use them um, uh, as part of their diversity inclusion issues within their organization. So basically as the face of saying we are diverse, right? 47% um, said that they are asked to help non-people of color um, um, in tech organizations with no pay. So basically to volunteer their time for this work. Um, another 59% uh, um, as I again said, work both full, have a separate full-time job and volunteer and do work within the local Black tech community. Um, next slide. So when we're thinking about the topology of Black public interest technology, as you've defined it, uh, Tayo or University of Michigan, and your research has defined it and where we, where our fellows um, identify, um, 
where it says to take the, the characteristics of um, uh, uh, a public interest technologist is to take on the invisible labor within institutions by advising leaders and volunteering to help strengthen DEI practices. That's similar for us. 72% again said that they are asked by city leaders um, within their cities to help tech related issues um, for minority communities. And 59% uh, agree that working full time jobs um, can be, and doing this tech work can be stressful. But that's something that we, all of us on this panel, all of you um, that are watching in, know that or probably have experienced. Um, next slide. So in the crosswalk of what a technologist and our BTE builders, here's where there's differences. Um, when it comes to developing and refining product, um, refining uh, product prototypes, 28% uh, of our fellows have a tech background, right? So they have that tech degree, uh, engineering degree, or um, computer science related degree. Um, when it comes to translating technology concepts into non-technical lang language, 60, that's 65% of our fellows report um, doing this work, trying to build the digital divide um, for our community, and only, but only 28% of them actually have that technical background um, needed to, or not needed, but technical background that we think is needed to do this work. And then when it comes to articulating a vision to inspire enthusiasm for the uh, for techno technological solutions, 59% of the fellows uh, surveyed wanted to build a bright future for our community, um, but only 28% of them, again, have this tech background. So what are the um, next steps and recommendations for policymakers, um, folks that are on this panelist, um, those of you in the room should consider. So one is to develop a malleable definition of public interest technology, hence the purpose of today's discussion. Um, that includes the lived experience of Black people um, uh, doing tech work in their cities uh, who may lack the technical background skills. So they may come from other majors or other uh, backgrounds. Um, we should deconstruct the popularized fields of study and work with emerging public interest tech fields. Um, but we shouldn't just focus on the algorithms and big data concerns, but also, or more importantly, like the digital divide, internet access, um, the loss of automation, the loss of jobs through automation and so forth. And then something similar to what Tayo had said, develop the funding mechanisms that not only support the development of program and projects, but to accommodate the amount of free labor that um, our community is asked to do within their cities to solve the uh, tech disparities. And I wanna turn it back, wanted to see if there are any questions um, from the group from the or in the panel that and or turn it back to Tayo. Yeah, um, th thanks, Melissa. There is a question um, that is specifically meant for you. Um, so there are, there are some some questions coming, and I think it makes sense for us to take two of those. Um, um, something to do with slide number 18. Let me just read it out. Uh, can you describe the activities? I know what it means to dismantle bias and algorithm, but the rest are unclear. And so this is to you, Melissa, in terms of um, reasons for studying tech work in the Black community. Well, the reasons for studying tech work within the Black community? Yeah. Is that what you said? Um, yeah. Well, we have to think about um, the biases that are inherent um, in the tech algorithms um, that are, are currently uh, being used to either um, to either, Fallon, feel free to join in here. Go ahead. Oh, let me just jump in super quick because I, I think I read the question differently. Um, well, well, how we operationalize the other ways that they do community tech work. So when you talk about digital divide, 
we means you're, you're working either at the local level or at the state level to, to get broadband access for your community. And if we're talking about social entrepreneurship or working tech entrepreneurship, you're working to either find capital for black tech entrepreneurs in your city because your local entrepreneurship or incubation center does not allow for that level of engagement. And so that's what that's how they interpreted um, those questions. Um, and that came out in our conversations with them. Awesome. So um, uh, maybe if like for reference, uh, if uh, Angela could help us bring back slide number 18. So that, that kind of has a kind of a point of reference for this question. Um, thanks a lot, Melissa. I, I think a lot of what you kind of um, alluded to, more so towards the tail end, the tokenism, um, the kind of working without pay, which kind of that last that last phrase it, it itself uh, uh, kind of reveals a lot in terms of what's the value that folks put on this work. You know, if if if, if uh, in some form uh, folks are asking you to do it without pay, you know, uh, there's another question that came in with regards to um, I believe both our work, but more so looking in terms of dealing with universities, saying if universities wanted to replicate their studies. Could the questionnaires and method methodology be shared? So, so I take it that these are the instruments that we use on our own hands. So this is from Kenneth. And yes, we'll be happy to share um, uh, those instruments uh, with you. We essentially rework in them for high year too, but we'll be happy to share those. Um, there, there, there is one more question, but I reckon that I would just save that one until when we move proper into the pineapple discussion, and then I will field it at some point. Um, so can we, we will switch gears now um, and then we kind of move into the panel discussion proper. Um, again, I'd just um, I'd like to uh, quickly just um, acknowledge my panel members, um, Alan, Rema, Emeka, and Selene. Um, they, 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 among them, you know, they essentially check all the boxes in terms of what we need across the spectrum of the paid tech space, you know, and, and I think we really appreciate um, them making the time to have this conversation with, with us today. Given the fact that a lot of what we're talking about is about pathways, which we know may be crooked, which we know may be jagged, you know. Um, I would like Fallon, Emeka, and Rayma, um, depending on who chooses to go first, if you guys could kind of give us some insight into the unique pathway that you, you took into the pet field. Mecca, you want me to start? I can, I can jump in. Um, so, it, you know, I would definitely say that my pathway was definitely not linear um, at all. Um, I started off with an interest in social entrepreneurship um, I left the world of banking uh, to think about you know, how can I use my skills in finance uh, to you know, support uh, the social venture that I, that I was developing at the time, uh, helping young people pay down student loan debt uh, through, through volunteering. And so that, that sort of uh, idea sort of led me to uh, an academic career path at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and I enrolled into the Heinz College uh, to study public policy uh, and management. And through there, uh, essentially being at the nexus of, of you know, policy and technology, uh, social skills and technical skills, and sort of you know, merging these two disciplines together. Um, in a sense, I was, I was sort of in this space of public interest technology before the space was even defined. Um, it was through that experience where I actually was able to connect with information systems students, engineering students, computer science students, to actually develop uh, this social venture, this idea that, that I had, um, and really uh, fostered this, this belief in multidisciplinary um, approaches to uh, you know, defining problems and, and, and implementing solutions with other people who have different pers perspectives, different lived experiences, et cetera. And so uh, from there, um, we graduated, ended up working in consulting, uh, working for uh, federal clients um, and, and leveraging some of the skills that I developed at Carnegie Mellon um, in terms of management science, um, thinking about optimization, portfolio management, 
some of these technical skills that I learned, um, in addition to you know policy innovation and creation, um, was able to sort of leverage those skill sets um, through client work. Um, so in the this summer of 2016, uh, you know the death of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling at the time um, really you know shook up my career pathway. Uh, here I was developing these these skill sets and. Um, working directly with clients, um, but in the back of my head, you know, this this trauma, this generational trauma, um, and sort of all of the historical um, baggage that comes about, you know, by seeing, you know, uh, folks like myself, um, you know, wind up in these situations where, you know, our lives are snuffed out, um, and so I had to make a, a, a decision, and I, I decided to to uh, pivot a bit in my career path. And I, I joined a national nonprofit organization. Um, and it was the first sort of experience where I was directly um, addressing racial equity um, and, what that, and, what, and what the role of sort of these lived experiences and community engagement, what that even looks like um, in terms of, you know, designing solutions and, and problem solving. Um, and so I was able to work, on, work in, uh, you know, over two, over hundred, excuse me, over hundred communities across the country, um, and you know, I, I eventually uh, used that experience to to start up and help co-found um, an organization to help social entrepreneurs. Because throughout my experience doing community engagement nationally, I was seeing these practitioners on the ground who had these very local and specific uh, solutions to address problems in their communities. And so during my time um, working at, at this organization, I was able to put together pitch competitions, being able to sort of surface from the ground uh, some of these best practices and some of this knowledge um, you know, that, was, that was present. And so I used that to sort of develop relationships with social entrepreneurs. Um, and through that experience it sort of led me to the University of Michigan project where we were thinking about these characteristics of social entrepreneurs, thinking about race and equity, and you know, thinking about you know, how can we begin to build and develop these pathways for individuals uh, you know, who are, would consider themselves social entrepreneurs, who are using technology, how can we build these pathways into this space that's, that's you know, is it a nascent uh, condition as, as, as we speak? Um, and really begin to think about how do we excavate some of these lived experiences um, and build knowledge that's helpful for this for this uh, for this career pathway for this field of public interest technology. So that was my sort of entree into public interest technology. It certainly was not a linear one. Thanks very much. That was that was. Um, I mean, thanks for that um, comprehensive uh, expose. Um, um, Fallon, can you? Can you? Um... Yes, and I thought I thought you were gonna call my brother Mecca. You know, I try to go um, beauty before age. So um, thank you for calling on me. Um, my introduction into the field of public and technology is very interesting because, like Raymar, I feel like I existed before we decided to canonize this term. And I think I'm gonna come and answer the question from three lenses. Um, first, I'm gonna do the institutional lens, how did I get here? And then I'm gonna do the personal lens, how did I get here? So my background, my research, my PhD is really in gender studies and looking at um, systems that are created to either create achievement or not to create achievement for black and brown girls in various school contexts. And so I have to begin there and say, I don't have a coding background. I couldn't code myself out of a paper box. Um, and if you ask me to, what is a script? I would say it's one day I should win a Tony with a script because I would do a play, not a language. And so let's begin there. But I was working with a historically black college and university institution um, in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's one of the noble historic institutions that trained John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, and is known for civil rights, social justice. It was the site for the sit-in movement in Nashville. The president came to me and he said, Dr. Wilson, you're young, you're finishing up your dissertation. Clearly you can teach technology, help us to understand this world of technology. 
And I was like, at first I'm like, I'm not that young, but sure. Um, and started doing a deep dive on how in 2013 and in 2012, the world of higher education was changing as it related to innovation. There were moments where the Obama administration wanted campuses to experiment with boot camps and other types of technical partnerships and how we redefine the Carnegie credit hour. So it was a lot of amazing conversations on mass operating courses and how MIT was doing this and how Stanford was doing that and all of these Ivy Leagues. And yet this small historically black college and university in Nashville, Tennessee has asked me to think about how they who do not have a science um, based curriculum could compete and re-engineer themselves for this new world of technology. And so I kept hitting roadblocks with that, um, primarily because yet again, having conversations in this new space of higher education, number one, HBCUs don't come up in the conversation. Hispanic serving institutions don't come up in these conversations and minority serving institutions as a whole are not a part of these conversations. And so I would go to Code for America and I would go to all of these amazing conferences they had. And I'd be like, look, look at our institutions, look at how they're changing and how they, will have a, 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 a historical and a federal mandate to be able to empower people of color with knowledge. And when I think about public interest technology, it just seems that there was a nexus there because when you look at first generation college students, black students, what do they major in? They major in low earning, but socially impactful careers. They are in human services, they are social workers, which I am a trained social worker, so I shout out the show social workers. Um, they are community activists, they are all these things, but in this new emerging space of the public interest tech space, and I had some conversations with foundation officers too, they, they couldn't see how, the, how that was a nexus, and that really caused me challenges because if our major universities are being able to re-engineer because they have large endowments, our minority serving institutions too should be able to re-engineer in this new space because they are more likely to take um, high impact, um, high need students of color than our predominantly white institutions. And so that's one entry for Dr. Wilson into it. The second entry was, I realized that working in my historically black college and university, they're only gonna let me do so much. I mean, institutions are by design bureaucratic and they don't move as quick as they should. And I know that's for most universities, not just for minority serving ones. And so I developed an organization in Nashville called Black and Tech Nashville because I realized that I, um, Dr. Wilson was being asked by the mayor's office to write the Smart City Report to, of course, to bring all the DNI to it. But of course, I gave them way more than DNI because I do have a PhD from the University of Chicago um, and helping the city to do a lot of tech work. And I could see on the horizon how Nashville would change in the next 10 years. And I worried that people that looked like me could not take, take advantage of the benefits of this new space, right? So I founded an organization with two co-founders and we started having conversations and we hosted the first conversation statewide in Tennessee around inclusion, diversity, and equity in tech. We pulled on the state, we pulled on our cities, and we said, we need to have a conversation about this. And then all of a sudden it begins to roll, right? Then I begin to ask, be asked at the state level to do things, all these things not paid not paid, um, even though I bring the expertise that they need in this space to really make it inclusive. And so my entry into it has been through institutions wanting to re-engineer themselves to compete, even though historically and by definition, I think they fit public interest technology. Secondly, encountering government and government interactions that told me that they really did not understand it themselves, let alone why it should be an inclusive, inclusion um, framework to it. Um, pushed me even further. And then most importantly, my personal reason. I grew up um, like many, um, I, I'm only one generation removed from poverty, right? Which is significant to tell, though I don't like telling the story because I think some people think all black people are poor and we are not. Um, but I have to, I haven't to have to tell the story. Um, and so my father worked as a mechanic and in the eighties and many academics would talk about Reaganomics and how so many jobs were outsourced overseas. He lost his job and there are a lot of other types of social outcomes that came from that. So when we had crisis in our family, um, we had to go to my uncle who drove a $28 um, 18 wheeler. He made $28 a day. And so we went to him when we had like 
severe crisis moments financially. I tell people, not just academics, because I think we get it, um, but I tell people who are non-academics, people that are like my mom and my sister, why should you care about this new innovation space? It's because I fear what my experience with poverty will look like if every job that had a, had, had, had a wheel attached to it was no longer in existence this very moment. And so the notion of a future where either deficits and code and algorithms and all the deficit data we collect on black and brown people, right, became what we fed computers and what they came to know about us gave me great fear personally to be able to understand and translate. And also as Andrea knows, who's a great colleague of mine, um, push against the, the formation of this new discipline. I am going to push it to grow so that it includes black and brown people at its core, not as a periphery, which means challenging the definitions on how we canonize this new space and that technology as a tool unto itself may not be the ultimate driver or outcome of what we should be looking at. As I said, again, I am not someone who has a tech background. I understand research and data and I understand people and I'm a translator. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot. We really appreciate that kind of uh, kind of a multi-dimensional insight into your pathway. Um, I, make a, I mean, I think you could speak to, I mean, this should be your forte. I mean, in terms of what you see is what you get. I mean, in terms of this with the week, what uh, this bias algorithm, the data, but I think kind of couch that within the broader framework of your own pathway, you know, into pay. Sure, sure. My own pathway probably was a little more direct uh, in this regard than <clears throat> my fellow panelists in the sense that um, I knew from the time I was a 10 year old boy that I uh, wanted a, a career in technology. Uh, when my, my single mother um, who was raising my brother and I in South Memphis, which is an economically challenged part of Memphis, uh, made a miracle happen for me to get a Texas Instruments home computer. And I learned how to make my very unusual name show up on the screen. And then I went and bragged to my mother uh, back when you know the computer was plugged into the TV that my name was on TV because you never saw my name on TV, right? <laughs> so uh, that was my sort of foundation of becoming a, a producer of technology uh, as that little boy. And, um, and I had a good opportunity in high school to go away to a boarding school uh, in New England to, um, and was exposed to a much wider world than I grew up in in South Memphis, um, and including uh, much more uh, intricate perspectives on history. I was already a, a good math and science kid, and I was already interested in computers, but it was there at, at, um, in boarding school that I uh, got, gained an appreciation for the history, especially with respect to Africans and their contributions to math and science. And that's when I realized that uh, you know, I had a role to play uh, um, in changing the narrative uh, that too many of us uh, falsely believed. You know, we've, we had this false narrative that this is not something that Black people could do, right? That, or if, if we had contributions, we were followers or we were just footnotes. Um, and it was, it was there that I began to, to uh, be introduced to the idea that the originators of uh, much what we, of what we take for granted in this space um, look like me. And so um, I, I decided um, uh, after a visit to Morehouse College, that's where I was going to go uh, to college. And I majored in computer science there and, um, and was a, I like to think was a strong student. <laughs> uh, but I will I'll definitely say that it was at Morehouse that it gave me, a, uh, it really helped me to appreciate the complexity and diversity of Black men. Right, uh, and, and, and that gave me an appreciation of the complexity and diversity of the wider world. Um, and, uh, and those foundations that Morehouse offered me with respect to uh, democracy and equality and justice and respect for, uh, uh, for hum humanity um, uh, really cemented for me uh, what I still didn't even clearly understand then, but now I can look back with you know, 2020 hindsight <laughs> and recognize um, were those seeds with respect to public interest uh, technology. Uh, I went on to get a, um, a master's degree in computer science, and then I went and worked as a uh, software developer for 19 years. Um, and uh, in doing so, all along the way, I was uh, driven to be engaged in the community in different ways, um, volunteering, you know, 
taking kids on college tours and, um, you know, you know, volunteering on boards of schools and things of that nature, volunteering in my own kids' schools. <laughs> um, um, and it, uh, ultimately, I, um, and I give a lot of credit to uh, Kimberly Bl Bryant of uh, Black Girls Code, who uh, allowed me to uh, launch the Memphis chapter of that great program, um, uh, really because I was trying to get my daughters interested in that boring thing that daddy did. <laughs> um, and uh, that uh, I led for uh, about two and a half years before uh, founding Code Crew with two others. Um, and Code Crew back in 2015 was uh, our way to focus on, especially on this particular market, which uh, is in, in Memphis is we're, you know, 65% African-American city. We are, uh, our, our county is, is majority black and soon the entire metro area uh, will be majority black, assuming, assuming they got the census right last year and it wasn't messed up by that last guy. Um, that uh, we'll probably see that reality. And so, and so um, Code Crew, uh, our, our nonprofit is a nonprofit organization very focused on, on uh, getting black and brown uh, men and women, boys and girls to, to see themselves as producers of technology and to be contributors to, to uh, a better world with uh, using technology and being tech producers, whether they pursue college, career, entrepreneurship in the space. And so, uh, and we've always done that from a perspective of you're not just learning these skills. You are you are uh, making a unique contribution, and and you're you're empowered with skills that are increasingly shaping the world. How are you going to do that? You know, so found as foundational as this as the as the tech skills that you learn are also the uh, non-technical elements uh, from how you present yourself to the ethics. Of, of technology and how to use that uh, to better communities. And so, so whether, it's, whether it's kids, and now we also train adults, whether it's, it's, it's kids focusing in a hackathon on school health or human trafficking, we've had them build systems along those lines to, to, uh, to adults recognizing that uh, they're on the front lines of a, of a uh, new eco ecosystem, if you will, that that uh, includes them, and that they have a an outsized role to play um, in in uh, changing what um, uh, we know power um, historically has been slow to concede, as Frederick Douglass uh, alluded to. And so, um, and so that that is that's been my pathway. That it's been sort of an independent passion with respect to public interest and public good, uh, tied to my ten year old boy interest in technology that turned into a career. Uh, to where five years ago I quit my job to do this uh, full time uh, in the form of code crew. So that is my that is my pathway and my story. Thanks a lot, Emeka. Um, and actually, I want to just say something quickly. So I mean, across uh, hearing uh, the viewpoint from from Hemeka, from Rema, from Fallon, I mean, we could see that there's there's, there's a kind of a variety of exp of like ways of getting into a pit field. Um, we could take a look at each of these folks as if they're like archetypes or like persona that could represent a whole group segment of um, population. And I know that um, uh, that um, we have like a 130 um, kind of a, a, a kind of a, um, uh, when we have to wrap things up, but I reckon that these conversations are really, really crucial and that there's a need for you to just kind of let it flow the way you kind of see it. And I think that's really crucial. Um, I'm going to kind of just switch things a little bit, and I'm going to bring um, Selena on. Um, so um, she she was part of our experiential learning program, and I want a unique student perspective on this. Um, looking in terms of the pairing that you have, Selena, in terms of being matched with a pit entrepreneur, can you can you kind of um, give us some insight into that? Uh, particularly in terms of what is the value added by that interaction? What did you gain from that proximity? Um, can you can you can you kind of shed some light on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I must premise my remarks with saying that um, this is off the record and off duty, um, given my professional uh, work. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, um, Tayo, um, while at the University of Michigan. I took part in um, the experimental learning course uh, by Professor um, Hampshire. 
um, and got an opportunity to work directly with um, a BIPOC entrepreneur. Um, his specific work really entitled and worked towards, um, he hosted a think tank um, in Detroit um, to kind of look into technology um, and see, you know, what opportunities were available um, to have conversations around technology, uh, both on human capital end um, and both as resources um, to kind of give to the local Detroit area. Um, so while working uh, with um, directly with an entrepreneur, um, I was really able to, I think, see from his perspective um, the importance um, of just being, I think, a, an entrepreneur of color. Um, and coming in with a very different perspective. Uh, while working with um, him, his name is Dwayne, um, we worked on trying to evaluate um, short-term learning programs, specifically coding boot camps um, in the Detroit area, um, and attempted to figure out, you know, the marketplace, um, not only for coding boot camps, but, you know, how are students of color being allowed or not allowed um, to enter that pipeline um, and more generally short-term education programs and whether those programs actually prepare them um, to be part of uh, public interest technology or enter you know, a technical career um, in technology. And so it was just interesting, I think, with him to be able to go on this journey um, you know, we got a chance to talk to um, a local coding boot camp um, that he had connections with um, entitled Grand Circus in Detroit um, and really saw, you know, that an ecosystem around coding boot camps um, in Detroit existed, but it was very national. Um, it was not hyper local, which was what Grand Circus was. Um, and what Dwayne really wanted to, I think, bring about um, in his work with his organization as a BIPOC entrepreneur. Um, he really wanted to leverage, you know, local programs and technology um, for, you know, students of color um, in the Detroit metro area. Um, and so it really, I think, touched point on, you know, the, the purpose of the course, which was to ensure that, you know, students like me had an opportunity to learn from entrepreneurs of color um, and how they see, you know, the work on the ground um, and how important that is um, to their daily jobs and to their communities. Um, and so I think my ultimate takeaway from working with Dwayne um, and really helping evaluate, you know, the purpose of coding boot camps um, in the local Detroit area um, was to really see, you know, the conversation that we're having right now, um, you know, the importance of understanding how the pipeline uh, to tech careers works um, and, you know, whether existing its structures um, like short-term education programs are working for students of color um, who, you know, want to come into technology careers or want to learn more. Um, so I think we really had an opportunity to continue those conversations, um, but also, you know, bring in very important, um, I think, pivotal, you know, public leaders, you know, whether it was the leader of Grand Circus or, you know, wanting to connect um, to, you know, local government officials to kind of share what we had found, um, really building that network, um, you know, not just, I think, within entrepreneurs themselves, um, but across their communities. Um, I think those were one of the biggest takeaways. Thanks a lot. And I'm going to come back to that at some point, uh, even more so. This interface, where we're looking in terms of how we could use some of these insights to better engage with folks in the corridors of power, you know. But in the interest of time, and given that I see questions and popping up here, I'm going to kind of take one of these questions and then throw it back to the house. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, it, it says a typical refrain that I hear in entrepreneurial cycles is not to be afraid of failing. Yet I hear from underrepresented groups that there are consequences, and these cons consequences are much higher when you fail. And these changes the risk calculus for potential entrepreneurs. Um, can one of you address that? Um, saying the fact that don't be afraid to fail. Meanwhile, there's a lot of consequences when this happens. I, I can speak to that, Ty. I mean, this is a, a great question. I think uh, that was Kenneth Wong, I think, who posed that question. So I want to give him a shout out for, for that. 
definitely um, is a is a phenomenon. I think is is uh, especially felt for uh, black and brown uh, entrepreneurs. Is this 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 fear of failure, this fear that you get one shot, um, and depending on how you succeed or not, uh, it's sort of representative of your of your entire community, which is which is which is um, which is a problem. And I think we talk about you know black futures. We think about by POC futures in tech, I mean, there has to be this ability to fail. Like there have to be this ability to be able to fail, to learn, to iterate, to try again, and to do that over and over and over. Because that, because only until then is, is when we'll actually be able to, you know, develop knowledge, uh, develop new solutions uh, that can address, you know, some of our society's most, uh, you know, pressing challenges. And so, I definitely have experienced that personally, um, failure and what that looks like as a social entrepreneur. Um, so, and, and, and in our research, uh, this, this kept coming, this kept coming up. Um, and so I definitely think that within this pathway to public interest technology, um, the ability to be able to, uh, you know, sort of create a lab or uh, a sandbox, I use this example of a sandbox, um, a lot of these solutions uh, you know, come through, uh, you know, come from a, a, a hypothesis, uh, some tacit knowledge that you have, but you have to have uh, an opportunity to really test those. So yeah, thanks for the question. Can I... I would add, probably push back a little bit on Ray Mar on this one. I, fundam I fundamentally believe that I don't think Black people have to fail anymore. Um, I believe that the experiences that not decentralized, but the experiences that Black people have had in order to create a social impact model does not necessarily, they don't need to go through iterations. They need capital. I think, I think you put a lot of weight on, um, on, on entrepreneurs of color, whether they're doing social impact or regular business models, um, to say that they have to go through these iterations, but it, it just prolongs the fact that there's no capital for them, right? And I would venture to say, hey, I wanted to, I wanted to create public interest technology as a field unto itself six years ago. I created Humanity EDU, which would re-engineer HBCUs for this new space. But six years ago, I could not get traction. I think one investor told me, oh, it's such a lofty goal, Fallon, to think that these historic institutions that have produced iconic Black people who have led movements could be the place where we grow public interest technologies and be a, at the vanguard of canonizing this space. But, I don't, but I'm not going to fund you. It's a, loft, it's a great goal, Fallon. Right. And what I found in working with historically black or brown people um, and institutions and with the types of social impact models that they have created to help their communities, they have clients, they have the product, it has been verified and tested, and they continue to fail, not because of the product, but because we have yet to figure out the value proposition of funding them fully. Right. And part of the work that I have done with the FCC recently, we just put out a report that looked at diverse tech entrepreneurship support organizations across the country. And the main thing that came back from those organizations is we have the clients, we have the customers, we have the impact models, but we can't find the funding because we don't fund black dreams. We don't fund people of color dreams, right? Um, and, and, and I'm talking as someone who had to reposition herself from Humanity EDU and now do nonprofit work to build the ecosystem so that people don't have experiences that I've had over the last six or seven years trying to do this work. Not because Fallon has gotten 10,000 rejection letters from all the fellowships, but let me not, let me not. There are only like six social impact fellowships in the country, right? That can help fund people of color who don't come from generational wealth to do the amazing work that they're trying to do. I don't know if we need more time to fail. We need more capital. So that's, um, I mean, actually I like kind of the way you guys took the, took different views there. And at some point, I think I'm trying, or maybe I would try and reorient, reorient it where I'm looking at those broader conversations, looking in terms of not just the challenges, but also opportunities and using that to frame a vision of the future. And so I'm going to come back to that, you know, but I think I want to quickly take this question that is meant for Emeka. Uh, but you guys feel free to kind of chime in. 
um, uh, there's a question from Justin, which I like a lot looking in terms of what are they looking at the specific challenges of rural areas. So he said, is there a certain mixture of sensors data that can help us target areas for educational impact? How local can we get with our focus on enabling access to tech? You know, I know that larger cities do get um, more attention, but I can't get the idea out of my head that the more rural and possibly disconnected towns and communities might provide alternate pathways that do not currently exist. Emeka, do you want to make a stop, take a stab at that? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, our work at Code Crew, at least, has been very focused on all, right? That, you know, we do a lot of policy and advocacy. And when I make the argument uh, at the state level here in Tennessee, at least, that uh, every child should have, in every school and every grade should have access to quality computer science education, right? That, that, that there's a focus on all, which really is a matter of addressing those who have been historically excluded. Um, and we know that um, black and brown people have been historically excluded. We also know that rural communities are historically excluded uh, from, from opportunities when it comes to like our, our model of how we distribute the internet in this country, right? And how that is uh, lacking in rural communities because the, uh, of cost factors, but a lot of ex weak excuses, if you ask me, uh, because it's not been a priority. Uh, and then many, many on the flip side in urban communities where the, the, uh, the infrastructure may be there, but the ability to pay for it isn't there, right? Uh, and so you still have zip codes like here in Memphis that have 80% with lack of broadband internet access, for example. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so there's, there's parallels, if you will, between um, a lot of urban centers and rural communities, but, but, the, but uh, absolutely, um, you know, there's some fundamental infrastructure things that need to be addressed certainly uh, on the, on the, uh, on, from rural perspectives. And then when, you, when you're talking about, uh, I think your, your question was, uh, how local can you get with respect to this focus? Um, I mean, you can get very local, right? I mean, uh, you know, I think, I think um, like I said, it's both macro and micro in the sense that we need to advocate for all, right? And that's every community having uh, certain basics, right? That these things are, our right today, they're no longer a privilege, right? Our, you know, 150 years ago, uh, having a toilet in your house was a, was a privilege, right? But now, you know, now that's, that's, that's a basic right today, right? Uh, basic sanitation is a right today and, uh, and uh, access to technology, uh, both in terms of infrastructure as well as the educational opportunities, it's a basic right. And so uh, there, there should be advocacy on every community in this regard. Uh, you know, uh, boots on the ground in your rural communities, just the same as, as we do ar around the country, that the no community is more important or significant in this regard. And that ultimately it, it pays off for everyone, right? Because uh, especially I think COVID has outlined or, or highlighted for us that, you know, you can live in this rural community and work for a New York company, <laughs> right? And, uh, or start a startup in a rural community, which I've, I've seen in uh, places like uh, Corinth, Mississippi and, and other places. And so, so, um, so uh, uh, absolutely, it's 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 uh, thinking globally, thinking nationally, and acting locally uh, is is something we all ought to be doing with, uh, within this context of public interest technology. And so, uh, so I say to people, don't be afraid, uh, even in, in a rural community, to 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 uh, to join this movement and there and, and 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 grow your network in terms of connecting with others who are like-minded to make a difference in that regard. Thanks. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, I have um, I have a question that I want to direct to um, Selena. Um, looking in terms of, and feel free to tag a disclaimer here, uh, but I know that you were a student of public policy, and now you are uh, on, the, on kind of um, in the field of trenches as a legislative uh, staff member. But do you? What are your thoughts in terms of effective ways by which folks in the pit domain? Could better engage more constructively with, with than folks in the quarters of power, um, policymakers in the public sector, you know, elected and folks. And what are your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Chael. That's a great question. Um, I would say that I, I think personally, I was introduced to public interest technology in an academic environment, uh, being you know uh, a graduate student at the University of Michigan. Um, and so in itself, you know, we all understand or have an idea of what PIT is. 
Um, but we can't assume that I think members of Congress understand it the way that we do. Um, so I think it's very important to, you know, as we leverage our resources, as we're connecting, you know, tech entrepreneurs um, of color, you know, to this pipeline, that we're also preparing them to be, you know, educators about what PIT is. Um, I don't think, you know, a lot of the work that, you know, we're doing today, you know, in some semblances has reached the whole of Congress, you know, where we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion and the importance of diversity in technology. Um, but I think the conversations that we're having today um, and the way that we frame public interest technology has not. Um, so it's important, you know, as we develop this network to organize it um, and to be able to, you know, continuously be educating um, of public officials about the importance of public interest technology um, and the role that that has specifically for, you know, entrepreneurs of color. Um, we can't assume, I think, that, you know, our public leaders understand, I think, what is going on. You know, mm -hmm. at this point, we're trying to leverage um, the knowledge that we have on the Hill. And we have, you know, uh, I think a minimal understanding um, of technology and, you know, how to be literate around it. Um, and so, you know, that includes, you know, ensuring that folks who enter PIT, um, perhaps like myself, you know, go on to public service, um, whether it's a digital service, um, whether it's, you know, other public service within a federal agency um, or even, you know, Capitol Hill um, to be able to, you know, relay these lessons um, and, you know, relay the importance um, of public interest technology. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of pathways, um, but ensuring that we are, you know, constantly educating, um, that we are preparing, you know, folks to organize um, and that we're creating, you know, pathways um, into tech careers, but also into public service, um, specifically, you know, into roles that will allow us to kind of leverage public interest technology um, as, you know, a structure. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot for that response. I want to go back to both Rayman and Fallon. Uh, I like um, uh, the positions that you you guys took on on um, the last um, question or that um, you guys um, responded to, but I want to frame it in a broader context here. Where are we looking at the challenges, the opportunities, but then with a view towards the future, you know, kind of the vision. Um, there's a question from one of the audience members saying, what are the recommendations to increase moonshot funding and partnerships? The demographics that we address, that we engage with face not only social and economic challenges, but also connections and networks. Can you can you guys respond to that question, given the way I have it framed, um, where you acknowledge that there are issues at stake, but then with an eye towards the future, and maybe using as a vehicle this kind of a moonshot funding to kind of accelerate or kind of catalyze the change process that you will want or envisage. I'll jump in. So, you know, I think when, when, when I think about moonshot funding, I, I definitely, um, you know, it's definitely something that's exciting to think about, but, you know, taking a step back, I mean, it is uh, very, very risky to, to fund moonshots. Um, it's, it's, it's very resource intensive to do it. And so, and I think finding a set of benefactors and funders uh, that are, that are patient in the sense of, you know, discovery is a is a long journey, um, and these moonshots, you know, are certainly capable. But I think, you know, funding underrepresented uh, communities and perspectives, um, I think, is part of the puzzle. Um, really engaging these underrepresented voices into into solutions, um, I think, is, is is one of the first steps. But I think I'm going to go back to to. So what Selene was was alluding to, I think, and she, you know, from her experience in, certain, in terms of, you know, th this pathway that, that she's on, I think these connections really do matter. The finding people that you can collaborate with uh, very easily. Um, and so, you know, a, a system, you know, what, what we're thinking about is, you know, what's the process of knowledge creation, right? Mm -hmm. And so our, our year two efforts are around 
you know, developing a public interest technology knowledge network uh, that we could be able to, to make these connections within the ecosystem to spark innovation and new ideas. Um, and these moonshots, these moonshots can come from these, these you know, with, with tile refers to as, as, you know, another, as these, you know, the strength of weak ties. Like when you begin to interface and interact with people who are different from you, you come, you know, you develop uh, new and innovative ideas. And I think that's also uh, a foundational kind of aspect of, of the work that we're doing is like, how can we make these connections for more people and how can we do it in a way that's efficient, e efficient. Um, and so when I think about those moonshots, it definitely comes down to, to funding, uh, finding the right benefactors, making these connections within the ecosystem that, are, that we're, we're not currently making. Um, and then, you know, essentially just, just you know, allowing these relationships to, to develop. Um, but yeah, I think, I think step one is really organizing all of these, these practitioners um, and putting them on a knowledge network. Um, and certainly we talk a lot about that in our report. So definitely encourage folks to pick that report up um, and, and, read, and read through it and sort of, you know, let's, let, let's start the conversation on how we can do this and be more intentional. And I would say, um, I am not sure if the, given the work that I've done and, and not only Black Tech Futures Research Institute, but the work that we have done in tech entrepreneurship spaces for people of color, um, I don't know if I'm dependent on philanthropic communities or other, I think they should fund broadband. I think everyone should be connected to the internet in this country. I feel like that is a safe way to begin talking about how you get a, a robust and continuous pipeline of tech entrepreneurs and also of those who are technologists. We have 40% of our country don't have access to the internet. And when you're able to do that, I think I, I think funders can see that as an, an immediate type of thing, trying to get them to buy in to products, our social imp impact products. It is it has shown consistently that we just don't they don't have it to give, not financially, but the conceptions on the value propositions for why we create the products we want for our communities to help solve social problems. So I'm gonna give so let's give them a social problem they can't solve give everybody in the country access to the internet. And then by doing that, work with community organizations on the ground with the municipalities who are already doing the work. The work that Mecca does with Cold Crew and also hosting a conversation in Tennessee about interrogating the concept of what, con what constitutes a broadband internet, that just because you have 23 down, five up, and you have a household of five, and you're located in the rural part of the county, it means we need to really think about better definitions, but working with those organizations who may not consider themselves to be public interest technologists, because I'm also talking to the challenges, right? To the second part of your question, Tayo. Um, we really have to push beyond institutions of higher education and really begin identifying practitioners who already are doing this work based on the typologies we have created and be giving, give them the funding to do the work, right? Once again, I gave up my business aspirations of being an ex-EDU Udacity for the people um, because I couldn't get the dollars. I couldn't get people to buy into my vision. And so I spend my time now running a nonprofit, working with nonprofit organizations to do this so that we, so no one has the experiences that we have. And so when I think about the field of public interest technology and how we have to really bend the definitions been what consists of practitioners, been which institutions are invited, right? It requires that we have a very concrete conversation about even the privileges that our universities have to even begin having this conversation to canonize a discipline that is gonna guide our country into a more equitable automated future and those who are not at the table to have those conversations. And I think everything Raymar said makes very sense, makes good sense to me, but I, I am of the mindset now that I have to find, and the work that we do with Black Tech Futures Institute, we look at churches, we look at historical cornerstone institutions within Black communities that have helped us, as my grandmother would say, come over hard times, right? That would be our churches, that would be our HBCUs, and how to figure out to make them better and stronger for this new automated world. And so if any funding needs to go, it needs to go there to anchor institutions, then out to 
community organizations that is working with tech entrepreneurs to grow their businesses. Thanks a lot. Um, we want to be respectful of folks' time, but we're, indulge us. If you could give us five more minutes, um, I think that would be good. Um, I promise you it will be time well spent. Uh, but right now we want to kind of um, reveal um, uh, the finding from the poll that we conducted uh, at the beginning of the session. Um, Alberto, can you? Okay. All righty. So this is this is kind of a word cloud, just kind of that kind of proxies the number of times these words were showing up. I mean, um, and it's just to kind of reveal the frequency to which each one was punched in the chat box. Um, I would like one of the panelists to respond to these. Um, number one, looking, does this in some way reflect what you were expecting? Um, if it does not, why is that the case? Yeah. And then finally, um, time permitting, if we could look in terms of, when we take a look at these constraints, in what way can Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color who are in the tax base, in what way could they be empowered to address these challenges? I think it's uh, you know fascinating that access and equity uh, seem to be the dominant terms here. That's certainly, um, I, I think that's consistent of you know of what you know. I know that I, I, there's may not necessarily always be be uh, exact clear consensus on even public interest technology but as it as it moves forward to uh, being in that established field uh, foundational in that regard I think is uh, is access and equity and so it's uh, refreshing to see that uh, reinforced here amongst the responses um, and so um, you know the, um, I, what was the second half of your question Tayo again yeah so like um, looking in terms of these findings, which in some way, you know, kind of uh, progress the frequency to which um, folks feel strongly about each of those words, uh, whether it reflects what you were expecting, but now tied to Black, Indigenous, and folks of color who are active in this space, in what way could they be empowered, you know, to address, I mean, these issues? Yeah, so I, you know, I'm... Uh... So a, a lot of great points have been made about, um, and I have to I happen to agree with both uh, uh, Fallon and um, Raymar about uh, about the issues around failure and uh, and uh, capital, right? Uh, but uh, but being empowered to to uh, with the capital that you need to have that longer runway when things don't go perfectly, right? When some when some things uh, do inevitably fail, right? That there that there is this uh, power to to iterate. Well, at the same time. Uh, the, these well-developed ideas that we often uh, bring to, to, you know, to, to have access, you know, just, that just need capital to make uh, scale. Um, we need to we need to make that happen, right? Uh, and we need to. So, in terms of uh, us being empowered, black and brown, uh, or black and indigenous, and people of color being uh, empowered in this regard, um, you know, it, it is capital. It is room. To, it is room to fail. It is. Uh, it is getting uh, access to uh, the skills. Uh, you know, it's, it's also uh, being empowered to build the networks that we need to to work together in this regard. It is it is uh, 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 more attention on policy, mm -hmm. and and how that has um, uh, a wider, more reaching impact. Uh, and you know, so uh, a direct orienting ourselves in that regard, but in also orienting the community. Uh, in that regard, and, and and us driving that conversation uh, to to where we we uh, achieve that reality. Uh, so uh, that's how I would answer that. Thanks a lot. Uh, I really, um, I really appreciate your contribution. Um, each of the panelists member, um, so Lena just um, said she has a hard one thirty hard stop. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Fallon, Rema, Emeka. Um, I just saw something in the chat box uh, from Justin saying equity equals to ownership of access. And I think that is spot on. Um, I think we need to push these. We need to get to these regime, you know, where these access is not skewed and, and in such a way that penalizes a segment of the population. So uh, I will now button over to Alberto um, to kind of um, round us up. 
Well, first of all, it was an amazing conversation. Uh, I know that I learned a lot and I'm sure that our, our attendees learned a lot as well. Uh, I just wanna finish this conversation just posting again uh, the report from uh, that was published uh, by this in New America. So please copy it, tweet it and share it around, make it, make, it, uh, make some noise. We thank you again for, for joining us and um, we will be uh, posting this conversation on YouTube so you can also share it again. Please um, let, let, us, um, let us join again on our next Wednesday webinar and please keep an eye out for our newsletters and our website. Thank you so much. Have a good day.